everyone. I'm Dr. Rita Roy, CEO of the National Spine Health Foundation. Welcome to our Spine Talks presentation, where we bring you unparalleled access to world-class experts, like these doctors who are joining me on the panel today. Spine Talks brings you education so that you can get answers to your most pressing spine health questions. Our panel will be moderated today by Dr. Tom Schuler, Chairman of our Medical and Scientific Board. Well, we're so excited to be here in Las Vegas. Uh, what we try to do with Spine Talks is, is to get the nation's best experts to help you understand what works, what doesn't work, how to take care of yourself, and how to get more information. Dom Korik is here, who is the head of the organization that is hosting this conference, so we're very excited to hear about that. We have Dr. Toomey Allen, who's here to help give us his insight and his leadership from the organization, as well as Dr. Gogawala and Dr. Wang. So gentlemen, so we'll start with you, Dom. Can you tell us a little bit about what's being covered this week at, at your conference? Sure, this conference is the colloquially known as the spine section. Uh, it, it stands for the ANS CNS, which is the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and the Congress of Neurological Surgeons Joint Section on Disorders of Spine and Peripheral Nerves. So that's kind of a mouthful, so we go by spine section or spine summit. And we're here to, dis to discuss uh, all things spine, basically. Everything to do with spine, intraoperative, postoperative, uh, preoperative, patient care, uh, and, and to act as advocates for patients, as well as uh, our, our membership, which, is, which are spine surgeons. Well, there's so much that's happened in the world of spine, and we know that the entire concept of spinal treatment has changed. And we go from the, the dark ages and medieval treatments that prevailed in the 80s and 90s to the truly amazing technology that we have today and the knowledge and how to get it better. And I was talking to you, Dr. Wang, and we were talking about some of the advances and that there's some great treatments out there and obviously not everything works, but I didn't know if you had any thoughts for the public on, on the state of spine and what works and, and how, to, how to assess. Yeah, I mean, t Tom, first of all, my hat's off to you and Rita for starting the National Spine Health Foundation. What a fantastic need there is for information for the, for the lay public out there. Spine problems are so common uh, that basic, virtually everybody's going to be afflicted by some kind of spine problem in their life, right? And you guys are providing a, a medium by which people can get real information, not some kind of advertisement and whatnot. And, and I think you're bringing up an important point, which is that the diagnostic and the treatment elements of spine are so complicated. That's why we have experts like folks on this panel. And, and the evidence is building every day for new treatments or new diagnostic modalities. And I think, I mean, Zoe, you, you've been leading a lot of that. You were in the Wall Street Journal twice, I think, <laughs> talking about the studies you've led around the country, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think you're right. And, I, and also, my hat's off to, uh, to, the, uh, to the organization here, both uh, uh, for providing uh, information to patients that, uh, that patients need and in, a, and in a forum that is understandable. Um, what Dr. Wang is alluding to is we as uh, spine surgeons uh, get together, we organize ourselves, and we are as interested in getting the best outcomes for patients as every single patient uh, would be. And uh, part of our effort is to make certain that we organize ourselves together so that we collect our surgical uh, information in national registries so that we can document which operations are working well in what type of patient and we can customize solutions uh, for, for patients. So it's, uh, it's really important. One of the things that Dr. Wang didn't mention, which I think is really, really important to patients, is that you know, we've come a long way in spinal surgery and uh, a lot of people, uh, and I think Dr. Wang is one of the international leaders in this regard, have moved the needle towards minimally invasive uh, spinal surgery. And minimally invasive spine surgery is not for every type of spine problem, but when it is applicable for patients, um, it's a great solution uh, and uh, has uh, less time in the hospital, lower complication rates, um, and uh, faster recovery uh, for patients. So I think that's something that's, that's really important for us to focus on. So Lou, let's talk about that. What is minimally invasive? What does that mean? Minimally invasive surgery of the spine is, is I, I believe, has always been our destiny. Since we started operating on the spine, no one ever said, well, I'm gonna figure out a way to make this incision bigger to do the same operation. So since the dawn of uh, the first operations to decompress the nerve roots, which actually started in the 1920s, uh, is when the final connection was made that, oh, you're having pain down your leg? It's actually not caused by your hip or your sacroiliac joint. It's actually caused by a disc on a nerve root. It's hard to believe that in still some of our patients' lifetimes, that the operation to, to decompress something which is called a lumbar radiculopathy, pain down the leg, 
caused by a disc herniation. That's, that's only 100 years old. When, when surgeons began seeing the consequences of what they were doing to the spine, to get to the other side, to, to decompress a nerve root, to take the pressure off the nerve and alleviate the pain, they said, there's got to be another way to do this. And our destiny since that operation first started has always been to see how we can do things smaller and smaller. So what minimally invasive spine surgery, the way I would interpret that, if when, when a patient is trying to organize in their mind, what is minimally invasive surgery? It's getting the same operation that would otherwise be done uh, through a much larger uh, incision with greater exposure and disruption of the, of the anatomy, getting the same operation done through a smaller exposure, sometimes like what Dr. Wang does is using endoscopes um, or using minimal access ports uh, and accomplishing the same operation that would otherwise take a much longer time, a longer recovery, and doing the same job through a smaller uh, exposure. So, Dom, why, why do we care about minimally invasive? Why, why would a patient want that? Well, uh, it, like Lou was talking about, minimally invasive is not in its, uh, a certain size of an incision, it's a philosophy. And that philosophy is, is that you want to affect a change in the, the patient's pain by relieving the pressure on a nerve, but you want to do that in a fashion that disrupts the normal tissue as little as possible. So it's not to say that Lou does an incision that's two inches and I do a three inch, so he's minimally invasive. It's the concept of whatever he can do to decrease the, the pressure on and disruption <coughs> of the normal tissues is gonna be done to achieve that, that common goal of decompressing your nerves and getting your pain better. So, Yeah, I, I can perhaps uh, put this in, in, in real life terms. And, uh, and I agree with everything that, uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Korik just said. I remember a few years ago, um, my, my wife's father um, had a very bad uh, spine condition. He could barely walk, and he was in his 80s, and he had seen a spinal surgeon in London who had basically said that because of his weak heart and some of his medical conditions, and mind you, he was in his mid-80s, that he just wasn't a candidate for spinal surgery to fix his problem, and he had a very common condition known as lumbar spinal stenosis, where he had arthritis in his lower back that had constricted the nerves that were going down to his legs, and he just couldn't walk. And so I called Dr. Wang and said, you know, is there something that can be done? And what happened for my wife's father was he went from being inoperable with an open spine surgery to uh, going down to Miami to have a minimally invasive uh, operation through a small scope. And uh, the end result of that was that Dr. Wang's team was able to let him out of the hospital the next day. He used a lot of local anesthetic, so there was very little pain uh, for him. And he was walking on Miami Beach within three days of having his operation with absolutely normal heart function. And to me, you know, as I look at that, you know, one as a surgeon, but also as a, as a family member, you know, the opportunity to get an operation done and have, you know, minimal time in the hospital, be up on your feet, uh, walking quickly, uh, is just remarkable. And I think it just says so much about where spine surgery has gone in the last uh, 10 years or so. Mike, you want to comment? I mean, Zoe's being too kind. I think people come to Miami <laughs> Beach because it's warm in the winter, <laughs> and right now it's 80 degrees. Um, no, I mean, uh, this panel of experts, Tom, that you've assembled, you know, and, and Rita as well, she's a physician, right? The amazing thing about coming to these meetings, and, and all of us have a role in this particular society, um, is that we get to see the technology, the advancements, and I, I look around and I see, you know, Dom obviously is a, is a leader of new technology. Lou, who's been very much involved in Washington as an advocate for patients so people can get access to, to the treatments they need. Zoe as, as, an, uh, as a leader in science, you know, creating evidence for why we need to do this or that. But to me, I'm kind of a tinker and I really think that, you know, people are looking for the newer ways of doing things. The newer is not always better, but the new options provide the opportunity to make something very scary, right? Spine surgery is, for whatever reason, considered very scary for people in America. It really doesn't need to be always so scary. And the technologies, whether it be like, uh, like robotics or uh, some cellular materials that can help bone grow or the devices that allow us to do minimally invasive surgery, these are all integral. And, and actually, Dom Korok's group at, at Carolina Neurosurgery, am I saying Carolina Neurosurgical, Neurosurgical Associates, right? Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine Associates. Yeah, you guys, I mean, you, you, you guys have more, and, and you, Lou, at the BNI, and 
Zoe at the Leahy Clinic and here in Miami for me, w one of the things we've been blessed with is to be here at a time when there's a renaissance of technology. Mm -hmm. And then building the evidence and the advocacy and, you know, and the education for that for the betterment of our patients. Well, Mike, I think that you touch on this idea of patients being so afraid of back surgery. And, and yet it's generally accepted that if you need a hip replacement, you get a hip replacement. Mm -hmm. If you need a knee replacement, you get a knee replacement. But back surgery, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't want to have back surgery. And so I think there's a real opportunity for patients and for the public to understand how far you've come um, as a field and, and, and your expertise in sharing that and educating people coming out of the dark ages into a renaissance of treatment to get people in their 80s even um, back on their feet. Uh, that, that, that's but Rita, I think, I think this is where you're doing a great service because the NSHF, I mean, what you can provide is this, this megaphone so people can start to understand. And we could, I, I can imagine this being a teaser for a lot of future episodes to talk about why is it that people are so afraid? And you know, you're looking at a panel of folks who are actually very conservative surgeons, everybody here, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we were picky and, and, and we have really good outcomes, but why is it that people are so scared, right? Well, and if I could tag on to that, Mike, I think you make a great point because there is a dichotomy and that dichotomy is that spinal <coughs> surgery is a big deal and it should be a big deal to the patients. And the other point that I'll pick up on that you, that you, you lay down was the idea, we operate on an incredibly small percentage of the patients that we see. Um, we, we, you know, ruptured disc, everyone says, oh, you got a ruptured disc, you have to have surgery. Probably 60, 70% of people with ruptured disc don't ever have any kind of surgery. If you look at the amount of patient encounters we have at, at our group, we, we have upwards of about 30, 35,000 patient encounters, and we do about four or 5,000 surgeries. And that's for people who are actually seeing surgeons have gotten through that crucible. And so the reality is, is that we're operating on t five, 10, 15% of people, people who need it. And again, the people who need it, need it like Zoe's family member, Zoe's father-in-law, his nerves are being pinched. Spinal stenosis, it sounds like it's an intimidating term. Your spinal canal is a tube, and in that tube you have spinal fluid and you have nerves. Anything that narrows that tube is called stenosis. It's just a generic name for narrowing. And when that stenosis gets to a critical point, there's just no more room for the, sp the nerves. And you can't treat that. We're, we all advocate physical therapy. We all advocate non-surgical management. Everyone should have non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, consideration for certain injections. Surgery should be the last recourse, but when it gets to the point that there's no room for those nerves anymore, there's only one way to make more room, and that's to make more room, and that is, surger and that is surgical. Having said that, what Lou was saying, what Mike and Zoe are, are, are experts in, is doing that in as minimally invasive a, po a way as possible to allow the patient to become as functional as possible. We don't operate to make pain go away. We operate to make people more functional. Well, Dom, and I think that's where what, what Dr. Gogawal has been doing at Lay Clinic has been really important. The kind of evidence, uh, maybe you should talk about it, because I don't know that patients really understand. Like they, they ask for a doctor's opinion, but that's just an opinion. You're generating a science a body of science, right? Yeah, you know, I think one of the ways to think about this is that uh, traditionally, uh, the way that doctors, surgeons included, have looked at the results of what we do is to look at our x-rays and look at our MRIs and say, you know, as Dom just said, we decompress the nerves. One of the things that we have started to understand as we collect our evidence is that really ultimately what matters is what the results are for patients. When do they return to work? When do they stop needing to take pain medicine? When are they able to walk on Miami Beach for a mile without stopping? Uh, these are the things that are really fundamentally important to patients. And one of the nice things about this uh, Spine Summit that, uh, that Dom leads uh, here is that it's the largest organization of spine surgeons in the United States that get together and we discuss how to get patients better, how to measure how patients are getting better, and we do it with a patient-centered uh, approach. And I think that's really an advance because ultimately we need to understand how these operations uh, impact patients' lives and their families' lives. 
and uh, to document that and then design our approaches as we transform technology so that we get those results to be better for patients. And I think we're getting much better uh, at that than uh, we ever have been in the past. And part of the reason for that is that we've really considered the outcome of the operation from a patient's perspective. Well, th this is exciting. I, I'd like to say that you know I'm a spinal surgeon, I've been doing this for over 30 years, and yet I'm a consumer too, because I've got fusions in my neck, disc replacements in my neck, laminectomies in my low back where we decompress those nerves that are pinched. And I know Dr. Roy has, has been a benefactor of spine surgery. She had spondylolisthesis, the slippage of the spine, and had to have it stabilized and the nerves decompressed. So, so as, as consumers, I think it's important for the public to understand that, that this is something which is life improving, life changing, and, and that's what we're so excited about. Obviously, we need to pick the right treatment for the right person and everybody doesn't qualify for everything. So Lou, if you wanna talk a little bit about how we would select what treatments to give people or why people may be a candidate for a specific treatment or, or something. Yeah, it's, uh, I do wanna to touch on one thing that Dom said, because I think he, he that po the point that you made, Dom, is very important. Uh, people come for us for an evaluation and then when you tell them, like, look, you're gonna be okay, they go, Oh my God, I thought I was gonna have to have surgery. I said, <laughs> no, 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 we, yeah. we, you, you, they seem genuinely surprised. And they're like, well, I thought you were a spine surgeon. I go, I'm a physician who treats people with spinal conditions at times that involves surgery. And I do that when in pro, the other time, we, I have to explain to you why you're having what you're having. You, I have to explain to you what's going on. And, and we, we recommend, as, as Dom said, a course of physical therapy, achieving your ideal body mass index, and, and perhaps some epidural injections or other forms of non-operative measures, then you see them back and they, they're, they're ready to go back in life. So it doesn't, what we do as spine, we, we are physicians that take care of conditions of the spine. At times it involves spine surgery. The vast majority of the time, it involves giving them guidance. Now part of that guidance does involve selecting the operation, and that's where I can tell you when I finished my residency, it, it, we think about the dark ages. The dark ages may have been 2008 for me because the <laughs> clinical decision making that I have made, um, I've been fortunate to be to have Zoe as a mentor and as a friend uh, and involved with the, some of the studies that he does. And the expert panel that, that Zoe has assembled in this concept of, of having multiple individuals weigh in on, on what you're looking at and, and how that has that iterative process of, of seeing how some of my colleagues would, would handle things has made my patient selection. For example, not everyone with spondylolisthesis, like what Rita has, has had, requires a, a lumbar fusion. Sometimes the, there's, inc there's a lot of data that supports that they may just need a minimally invasive decompression, where it's, it's a motion-preserving, minimally invasive intervention that allows them to get back to life, to a higher level of function. Other times, based on uh, the data that, that, that Zoe has been able to assemble with his team, we make a decision saying, look, uh, go, well, I don't really want that procedure. I go, the, the data would suggest that you're in a category that is gonna have a very hard time long term. We, when, I, when, I, when I'm looking at a patient, I go, look, I wanna give you an operation, offer you an intervention that's gonna have staying power, perhaps the only intervention you'll need for the rest of your life. But if we look at this, and we ignore the data and we just go by what it is that you want as opposed to what the, the science would suggest based on all of your radiographic imaging, it, it's, we can't get there from here. One thing to add to what, uh, what Lou just mentioned is that I think for, for patients, one of the things that, uh, that probably a lot of patients do and is important uh, is to get a second opinion. And uh, what, what Lou is talking about is that we as a group of spine uh, professionals are really focused on spine health. We do spinal surgery, uh, we measure the outcomes from that surgery, but ultimately when we see a patient with a, with a problem in their spine, we wanna basically work towards getting them back to health. And sometimes that requires surgery, many times it, it does not. What we do with these uh, expert panels, and all four of us are on uh, these uh, expert panels, is we take more complicated cases that uh, involve the uh, lower spine primarily, and we have a group of experts look at that case, look at the radiographic data, look at the other clinical aspects that you sit down with your doctor to, to review, 
And because of uh, the technology that we have available to us, where the information can be uh, transmitted uh, electronically, uh, uh, essentially to someone's uh, personal phone, uh, we can get experts to look at uh, individual cases uh, very rapidly and then provide a comprehensive assessment for patients of how 10 or 15 doctors uh, looked at your case. One of the things that we're presenting here at the Spine Summit is that when 80% of doctors agree that your case is best suited for, say, a spinal fusion, or uh, uh, on the other hand, your case might be best suited for a decompression, the outcomes from a patient perspective are better. Uh, which suggests that there's real value in, in getting uh, second opinions or multiple opinions so that multiple people can look at your case. And so just for the audience, th this panel is not like random doctors from right. like little tick towns. These are no nothing wrong with them either, but like <laughs> these are major academic centers mm -hmm. of excellence, right? Yes, Fine. yes. And that's been really important to us that, you know, when we assemble groups of experts to look at these cases, um, as Mike says, these are people who are, you know, nationally or internationally known. And by the way, we should mention that these expert panels include uh, spinal surgeons from many places uh, in the world uh, that do excellent spinal surgery. So we get an international type of review for, uh, for patients. And uh, these uh, doctors have documented excellent outcomes, as well as uh, our doctors that have uh, contributed to you know, new information in the field by, in the form of publications. You know, but just to take it back to like the average person in America who's suffering at home Googling stuff, the thing that I tell my patients, and I don't want to go too much off the rails here, but you know, first of all, if you are looking for a spine doc or spine surgeon and you're looking for the number of stars, that is maybe the worst measure of who you're going for because I, I'll tell you, I don't know any spine surgeon I respect that's five stars. It's impossible. If you see five stars to me, that's paid for. I'm a solid 3.3, .3, I think. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, the public, they think that that's the way to go. They go yeah. with whatever the media steers them to. Yeah. And what we're talking about is something very different here. I think it's really true. We, we live in a world of ratings, right? Everything that we do is, is rated, you know, whether it's a restaurant that we go to or a hotel that we go to and whatnot. But spinal surgery is not a hotel. Uh, and it's not a restaurant. And I think we need to rely on the, uh, the spine section and s professional societies to help us determine which doctors are providing the best outcomes uh, because ultimately that's the rating that you really want to have. Uh, some of the ratings goes down because because uh, you read them, or at least my mother goes, you got another bad review? <laughs> no, but the, 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 the rating goes down because you tell someone you don't need an operation, yeah. right? And, the, and then they, they'll say, he didn't believe I have pain. Yeah. And then, because the, a patient right. in pain is vulnerable. Yeah. And they will do, they, they can be guided down a path that is not the right yeah. path. And then sometimes when you tell someone, you don't need an operation, this is, this is the course of action we're gonna take, you can tell you can, their body language is, oh boy. And, and then they say, he doesn't believe me. At the end of the day, uh, it is a vulnerable pa patient population, and it's a huge population because we already talked about how common back pain is. In, in fact, the second most common reason that people go to the doctor and typically the first most common reason that people miss work. So it's incredibly common, number one. Number two, the, it should be reserved for, for, and we can really dumb this down and say you, there should be two basic reasons you have an operation. One is that your nerve or your spinal cords are in, your spinal cord is in danger or two, your quality of life is absolutely intolerable like your father-in-law was. Mm -hmm. Those are really the only two reasons you should be talking about doing spine surgery. Uh, and the problem is, is that people have a lot of pain and, it, and, and, and there, are a lot of snake, uh, there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there and the internet has put those snake oil salesmen in front uh, of, of everybody. And so that's why I think what you guys are doing is so important with the foundation because you need to get through that, all that noise and you need to get to the bottom line of what, what my options are. Uh, and, and it's normal to be intimidated by it. Even we've thrown around spondylolisthesis and you say, well, geez, that's a fancy word. You know, spondylolisthesis, spondy means body, listhesis means slippage. It's a slippage of one body on the other. There's nothing fancy about it. There, but, you know, the point is that the, that, you know, people come in and like Lou was talking about, and they're, and they're sometimes looking for a quick answer. And surgery is not for a quick answer. Surgery is to either make your quality of life that has become intolerable, tolerable, Ken, or to protect your nerves or your spinal cord. That's it. 
Lou also made a, a, another important point that gets back to something we had started talking about a few minutes ago, which is that, you know, people say uh, or people hear, okay, I need a hip replacement, and there's not as much fear uh, around that. Whereas in spinal surgery, sometimes there's a lot of concern. One of the problems I think that we have in spinal surgery is that, as Lou mentioned, patients are in really substantial agony uh, when they have a serious spinal problem. And not all spinal problems can be fixed with surgery. However, when you have a desperate patient and a well-intentioned doctor who just wants to help, um, sometimes an operation gets done that doesn't work. And that operation that doesn't work, I think, has given spinal surgery uh, a bad name uh, in, the, in, the, in the general public's eyes. One of the things that I think we have done in spinal surgery to help ourselves is to document the outcomes from a patient perspective so that we can really reduce the number of operations that are being recommended to patients that are just not likely to work for whatever reason. But the opposite is also true, right? So I think this is one of the funny things about spine care is that we have competitors, right? So I, I, I know there are lots of surgeons out there that uh, and there should be none that do too much surgery that's unindicated. But I also know that that's even more so the case with the non-surgical spine providers. And I'm not indicting them because it's lower risk to do the other things. But, you know, we're, we should be really hard on ourselves. And there have been some really bad actors in the spine world that have been disciplined and it's become very public. But it happens in all the other worlds too, whether it be pain management, mm -hmm. whether it be um, physical therapists, whether it be chiropractors, and now you have anesthesiologists trying to do surgery, right? Mm -hmm. Everywhere you turn, they're doing surgical procedures that they're not supposed to do. Now, you can argue that the area is being blurred between surgery and not, but I just don't want everybody listening to think that, well, you know, spine surgery is just something that is purely reserved, but everything else is totally game. Minimally invasive surgery it, it, at some level becomes a catchword, and so people say, I'm going to have it minimally invasive. To Lou, what Lou talked about earlier, you want minimally invasive means doing the same operation, accomplishing the same goals of decompressing the nerves and the spinal cord and stabilizing the spine, but doing it in a, uh, in a tissue sparing way. It's not to say that it's, you know, you, see, you get on the internet and it's, oh, minimally invasive this, or you can cure that without surgery. That th there's a lot of snake oil out there, and there's n there's no question. So, Dom, what it. what advice do you give people? Like, it's like someone sitting at home, they're listening to us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, how do how do you go about as a patient looking for the right level of care? Because they don't, I, mean, I assume patients don't know. Like, should I have a shot? Should I have therapy? Should I have surgery? How do you guys counsel folks on what to do? Tom, what do you do? Uh, it, it's important for them to understand what their problem is. When, when we talk about it, their pathology. Do they have a herniated disc, a degenerative disc, do they have a facet joint that's arthritic, is there a nerve that's pinched? There are all these words that we're, we're throwing out here are structures in the spine. And it's how do we reach inside that black box of the spine, identify the problem, and then say, what is the best solution to this? And that solution may be non-operative. It may be, let's work on mobilizing tissues, strengthening muscles, trying an injection of some kind to see if we can treat it, or ultimately we say, this problem will not improve until we fix it. So the, the, the disc herniation we talked about, I always equate with a uh, garden hose that's kinked. If your garden hose is kinked, until you unkink it, the water doesn't flow. And what we do at the time of surgery is we unkink the garden hose, give the nerve some uh, relief and, and let the, the nerve function properly. And so it depends on what the pathology is in terms of what we recommend, but it's educating the patient about what their problem is and then what the options are. The good news, and on the flip side of what kind of what Mike was saying, is that when there is a surgical target, good news. And uh, because, like Dom said, the majority of the time we're saying I, there, you don't have a surgical target. And I think that's what you're, 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 you're trying to establish. Surgical target, no surgical target. When they have a surgical target, then we have a reliable way to get them to the other side and turn the page on this disrupt it's a huge disruption in their lives right they, they come in they they look like they haven't slept uh their their marriage is falling apart perhaps they're drinking too much alcohol they're they're taking too much you, you start listening to whoa your life and you have i go why are you going through this you've had all of these procedures done and you have it's it's the proverbial thorn in the lion's foot one little clump of disc right on that nerve root and they've been suffering for this since thanksgiving and one the patient i saw before i came out here i go 
why are you doing this to yourself? Well, I don't want to have spine surgery. One of the things that I think is really practical for, for patients, and Mike asked uh, Don this, but what I would suggest for patients is to look for a comprehensive spine type center where you've got multiple doctors that are working together. And um, I think that often helps because a collaborative approach to spine care allows the doctor who focuses on doing injections to be working very closely with a surgeon who does operations, who's also working very closely with a physiatrist that does physical therapy. And you have all of these people working together for you as opposed to going to a place where there's just one type of approach, either a physical therapy approach or an injection approach or just purely a, a surgical approach. I think for patients, the comprehensive spine approach is, uh, is probably the most valuable and it allows doctors to work better together uh, to get a solution for patients. One of the things that I sometimes hear from uh, patients is that they've been seeing a, uh, a, a, a group of doctors that say only does injections and they've been getting injections for a, a nerve problem for say 10 years and they then ultimately have an operation to get that fixed and they're just uh, amazed that uh, the last 10 years they were just going in and out getting multiple uh, little band-aid type of approaches that uh, weren't ultimately solving the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point, Zoe, when, when all you have is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail exactly. uh, and, and this comprehensive approach really is the way it should. You should work in concert with pain management, with interventionalists, with, uh, with other folks. But when in isolation, that's when you get into a problem. Uh, the other thing I think that's unique about uh, uh, spine pain, nerve pain, and you know it, Tom, and you know it, Rita, as well, people don't understand what you're going through unless they've had it done before. In other words, most everyone's broken a bone or stubbed a toe, and that hurts. But nerve pain is nothing like that kind of pain. Mm -hmm. Nerve pain is right. nauseating. It, right. it allows you to not sleep. It makes you depressed. It, 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 there are problems that go beyond you know, true nerve pain is something that really needs to be taken care of. And pain is your body's, typically your, your body's warning sign that something else could be coming. In other words, there are worse things than pain. That's typically weakness or loss of function in the distribution of the nerve or the spinal cord. These are things that have serious right. ramifications. A lot of times people say, well, you know, spine, you know, we're not saving lives, but, but I would argue you are saving lives because if you are a person who has suffered with a spinal condition, you do feel like your life has ended and the life that you've known is ended. And to be told you're never going to ski again, you're never going to, you know, get on the ground and play with your grandchildren again, it feels like your life has ended. So, um, you know, I think of these procedures and op opportunities to regain life as not just improving quality of life, but really saving life. It really is saving people's lives. And, and we don't think about this. We think about spine surgery as being elective. Well, nobody decides that they want to just have a spine surgery. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is, these are life-saving, life-preserving, and quality of life procedures, whether it's an operation or an injection, whatever the treatment modality is. Um, but to your point, if you've had debilitating spine pain, you feel like your life is over. So Rita, to that, that point, I, uh, I did my uh, studies in uh, neurosurgery in Boston at the uh, Mass General Hospital where the hospital was originally a uh, mental uh, asylum. And uh, I was interested in reading some of the stories and uh, there's a story that, uh, that your comments bring to mind. And that is that there was a patient that was um, placed in a, a mental asylum in Boston around the 19, early 1900s who was complaining of a fiery shooting pain down her leg. And she was described by the nurses as, you know, banging on walls and screaming and, uh, and curled up in a, in a ball in the corner. She ultimately died. And when they did an autopsy, she had a herniated disc. And it just wasn't known at that time what that was, but she was basically being called insane because of the level of pain that she was going through. And I think that's, that's an important point. And, and Dom mentioned that the, the level of pain that people go through who have uh, spinal problems uh, is, a, is, a, is an area, order of magnitude mm -hmm. um, higher than, than many others. We are trained in neurosurgery to do something called the Lasag sign, right? The straight leg raise. And Lasag was actually a psychiatrist 
Oh my goodness. He was a psychiatrist. He was not a neurologist. Yeah. He was not a neurosurgeon. Well, there was no neurosurgeon because you're talking 1860s in France. And the, what he used that sign to determine whether someone was, had a true psychiatric problem or had a genuine radiculopathy. Talk about mind-body yeah. all the time. And when you've got a debilitating spinal condition, you're not moving. Mm -hmm. And when you're not moving, there's all kinds of mental and mindful you know, consequences mm -hmm. to that. Talking about the evolution of healthcare, you're talking 1860, a psychiatrist is coming up with this exam finding. And it wasn't until 1934 that the disc herniation was diagnosed. Yeah. And we understood that, that that was something that could create a problem. And, and you think of the time and the evolution, and here we are in 2022, and, and the techniques we have, the knowledge we have, dwarfs everything we had before. And, and we know that in another 30 years, they're gonna be looking back saying, God, those guys didn't know very much. <laughs> but but, but it's, we're making it's, it's a process of we're learning. Progress. So I, I'd just like to close with getting some words of advice, some pearls of wisdom to help our patients that are listening and, and learning. So Mike, why don't you tee it off? Do you have a word of advice? I, I would like to see something that you're doing at the uh, Na National Spine Health Foundation come to fruition, which is a problem I've had at University of Miami. The number of patients who need a good opinion, it's, it's, it, it's millions of people a year, right? And I know the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic have a system where people can pay to send their MRI in and people are reviewing their, their data, but it's hard to get a good opinion. And I find that in my clinic, really what happens is the people who are able to get access, and I, I consider myself ethical, I don't know if other people would think that, I really try hard to do the ethical thing. And when they come to me, I, they always had some avenue in, but that means that I've lost the opportunity to help so many other people. I've treated almost all my neighbors. I see almost uh, on, uh, you know, upwards of 100 people a week in clinic. That's a lot of patients to see, right? So hence, not every review is gonna be perfect, right? I've gotta see a lot of people to do the right thing for them. And I would love to see a system, a clearinghouse, whereby humans, American citizens, can get ethical care, whether it's, as we've been talking about for some time now, do you need a surgery? What kind of surgery is Dr. Gogowalis figuring out for us? Um, you know, is it non-surgical? And, and give some authority to it besides having to go to an academic medical center. And I think, I think that's what this country really needs. Getting information, and I think that's what you're doing uh, for patients, is really, really necessary and important. And I would say for patients, when you're sitting down uh, and talking to an expert uh, and you have a spine problem, there are a couple of things that I think are really important to get answers to. One is, if, uh, if in the case of uh, spinal surgery you're having an operation, what is the data uh, around your recovery? When will you get back to work? When will you be able to get back to playing tennis? When will you be able to get back out on the uh, golf course? And I think you should really push your doctor to, to provide that information uh, to you. And quite honestly, if you have a physician that doesn't have that kind of information, that might be time to be looking for uh, a different um, uh, professional. The other thing I think that is really important for patients is to be able to have an honest conversation uh, with their doctor, uh, their surgeon, about complications. There can be complications from non-surgical uh, type strategies. There can be complications from physical therapy. Uh, but there can be complications from surgery. And having an honest discussion about what those kinds of things are, what they could mean, a lot of complications that can occur from surgery, for example, resolve very quickly and are not necessarily reasons not to proceed with having an operation, but you've got to have that honest conversation about what this is all about and what it could mean for you uh, before you then are, are able to make decisions. And then one last point I would just add is that, you know, we try to do this with our expert panels, but getting more than one opinion uh, about your condition, I think is just beneficial uh, in terms of getting a better understanding of what's going on. If I could say one thing to our audience, I, why wait until you have a problem? Why, we go, we go to the doctor, get our blood drawn every year. If your cholesterol is high, you start taking medication. If you have high blood pressure, take that. But in the meantime, in the third and fourth decade of life, all of our spines begin degenerating. We all begin to lose muscle mass. Personal story for me, at age 40, I threw out my back. Why? 
I was deconditioned. I had, I, I was a dad. Um, the three cheeses, mac and cheese was waiting there. The kids didn't need it. I ate that. <laughs> then my wife goes, here's your dinner. And then next thing you know, I've put on weight. I've deconditioned. I always envisioned myself as, as, as healthy and fit, and I wasn't. And I injured my back right before my 40th birthday, so much so that my wife had to cancel the entire birthday party, all the friends that were flying in, she canceled it because I was bedridden. Wow. This is all a true story. Wow. And, and I used to. I used to poo-poo physical therapy. I used to kind of like, well, I guess you can try physical therapy. The reality is I lost weight, I got my core strong, and I got better. Why wait? Why wait? Because then it's going to be the same story. I picked up a case of water at Costco. Boom. It's going to be that home improvement project because your spine is not used to anything. Your muscles are deconditioned. And next thing you know, you're building a garden in the backyard or you're doing a home improvement project. And then, then the whole world unravels. It is, it is preventative medicine that we do not, we don't communicate. If I could tell anyone out there listening, don't wait for the back problem to start. Preventive medicine. We, we all of I can lose another five. We could all lose a little weight. We all I need to get my core stronger and we all need to keep ourselves a little bit in better shape. We do that. If you ask me, that's what America needs. Spine surgery is a big deal. Someone is is is, is in there uh, manipulating your nerves, your spinal cord. The complications can be atrocious. So when you have a problem like that, what is the, the first thing that you should do? First thing that I would do is find the smartest person I know to talk about. And, and, and that includes guys on this, on this board. But the point is, is that look at the training of somebody to become a, a, an orthopedic or a neurosurgical spine surgeon. In, 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 for a neurosurgeon to become a spine surgeon, you have to go through four years in medical school, you have to go through a residency of seven years, and then usually a one or two a year uh, fellowship. So compare the credentials of someone like that to somebody who is on the internet saying that, you know, I've got the cure for back surgery. Well, if that guy had the cure for back surgery, he will have won a Nobel Prize. He wouldn't be on the internet looking to, <laughs> to you know, to sell you his latest, greatest thing. Talk to smart people, talk to people who are credentialed, people who are, who, who have done things in the field. And if you've got a bad problem, talk to the smartest person you know. And to Zoe's point, talk to a couple of them. Uh, and, you know, I, I know for a fact that everyone on this panel and any legitimate practitioner is not afraid to, p for people to get second opinions because they're confident in what you're, you're telling, you're telling the patient. So go ahead and talk to somebody else, educate yourself, but don't educate yourself to the point that you're going to try to run your own care. Find a smart person, an experienced person, and listen to what they have to say. Spine health is a lifetime commitment, and it only happens if you invest in it. And like Lou said, we have to exercise, we have to do fitness. Exercise is medicine. And at the end of the day, if we don't take care of our responsibility of maintaining appropriate body weight, doing our exercise, working on our flexibility, it's hard for us to walk in to talk to a practitioner and expect them to help. Uh, and so we have to understand that we all have our own responsibility and life's tough. We all, have, we all have obligations, family, jobs, things that get in the way and affect it. We need to be constantly working at this. And if we fall off the wagon, we gotta climb back on the next day and, and keep at it. It's a lifetime commitment. Motion is good. We wanna preserve motion. We want people functioning. And so that, that's important. And I just, I just am so excited about this panel. You guys have been great, it's been easy. Wonderful. I didn't have to do any of the Wonderful. interviewing. They all interviewed each other, so it made it very easy for me. So blessed to be able to hear directly from the world's leading experts. Um, and we hope that this education gives hope to people who are suffering.